Now, how do you even introduce Dr. Wale? How do you even begin? I mean, he's a man that is not, you can't, you can't fully, you know, uh, you know, introduce because his profile, his, you know, his, uh, his uh, impact in the church, in the corporate, in organizational, you know, transformation, leadership speaks for itself. But I'm going to try. Amen. I'm going to try anyway. Dr. Wale is an organizational culture, culture expert a business development strategist, prolific author, you've just seen the books, and more, newspaper columnist, and a popular inspirational speaker. He is a renowned corporate consultant and a mentor to corporate uh, leaders. He's very passionate about Africa, about young uh, emerging leaders, about uh, organization transformation and change, about the renewing of the mind when he ministers to the church. He challenges your mind. He challenges what you believe. He challenges what you think about possibilities and he challenges uh, leaders in the corporate and in the organizations to be able to rise and to, be, uh, to meet and surmount the challenges that are out there. He's involved in several organizations. One of them, you know, is of course Power Talks. Many of us have interacted with Power Talks and uh, at, Power, uh, at Power Talks he helps organizations to create the right cultural environment to spark a business and organizational uh, uh, performance. He is highly sought after as a consultant, a speaker, and a mentor. I personally, uh, you know, uh, count myself to be very, very, very privileged to have interacted with him and to have this opportunity for him to just come not only to speak to me, but also to speak uh, uh, to all of you. It's, it's an amazing. He's a wonderful, wonderful friend of my father in the faith, my mentor, and my bishop, Alan Kuna. And he is here uh, uh, to shift you. He's here to change you. He's here to challenge the way you're thinking. He's here to cause you to, uh, uh, to shift in your business, in your organization, wherever it is that you're you, you, you are a leader, whatever it is that you are, you know, working as a professional, he is here to challenge that there is more that you can be able to achieve. And he doesn't just challenge you, but he also equips you. And that's what mentors do. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to put your hands together as we bring to this uh, 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 microphone Dr. Wale Akinyemi. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Amen. Thank you so much. So thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Fantastic. Recover all, bounce back, and thrive. I said recover all, bounce back, and thrive. Um, the last two years have been very challenging for a lot of people. But the irony of it is that for another group of people, the last two years have been their best years ever, or the last one and a half years since COVID. All right? So for some people, it was bad. For some, it was good. But one constant is that for everybody, it was a season of monumental change. You know, for everybody, it was a season of monumental change where we had to rethink our existing business models. 
we had to rethink the way we were doing things. You know, so, and like you heard, I have, okay, I've written a total of 18 books so far. My, I brought just a few here because another thing I found out is that when you have too many options, it stifles decision making. You know, um, so I normally don't bring so many books so that I don't confuse you with too many options. Um, but I run a consulting firm and our model has pretty much been the same for many years. We sit down in a boardroom, we sit down in a hotel training, and we are either strategizing or training. But one thing that was constant that we in everything we did, it was physical. Okay? It was one hundred percent physical contact where we sat in a room with people. Then COVID showed up. And when COVID showed up, that model literally died. Died completely. Because there is no meeting, there is nothing physical anymore. So, now remember, our business was built 100% on contact. <laughs> and so now there is no contact. So, what percentage of the business is dead? 100% dead. So how come we're still standing? How many people during COVID experienced a disruption like that in their business models? We all did. I guess we all did. Now, then 2017, when my dad died, I got introduced to a platform called Zoom. 2017 was actually my brother in England who introduced me to it. I have two brothers, one in England, one in New, he was in New Zealand then, he's now back in England. And all our meetings in preparing for my dad's funeral, all our budgeting, all our, th was done on Zoom. And for the first time I'm saying, my goodness, we could share screens. We could do a whole lot of stuff. So I got excited and I felt this will be a very powerful business tool. You know, I tried to sell the idea of webinars to a number of my clients. And they told me point blank, it's not a viable option for training. <laughs> then COVID happened. <laughs> and the rest, like they say, is history. Now, so during, once COVID hit, these same clients, I now reached out to them and I said, you know what? I will take you through sessions on how to deal with disruption. Okay? And we began to do that with a number of companies. And where was the platform? It was on Zoom. And I realized, oh my goodness, more can come out of this. I had always had the dream of having a university. Um, I remember when I would share that with my wife, she would just, you know, Taiwo is somebody who she, she believes, she, she tells me often, there's a very thin line between genius and insanity. And I'm not sure which side you are on. <laughs> yeah. That's what my wife of 29 years <laughs> says to me. Eh? <laughs> anyway, so I saw that technology had given me a gift. That with this, I can start a 100% online university. So we launched it and we called it the Street University. 
where it's not about academics. It's bringing people who have done something to tell us how did you do it? What were your challenges? Where did you fail? Now, we run weekly webinars and then we have a website which you can visit www.thestreetuniversity.com thestreetuniversity.com and you will be amazed because what we have there is now like a Netflix for empowerment. And at the last count, we have people visiting that website from over 40 nations. Now, this is something... Thank you. This is something that did not exist before COVID. Then, I remember when we first launched, some investment guys from the U.S. approached me and it was still at the very formative stage. They approached and they said, we would like to invest and partner with you. And I'm thinking, what are they seeing? You know, I'm always very careful when somebody just comes and their excitement in investing in me is more than my own excitement. <laughs> because it means they are seeing something that I'm not seeing. So we had a few meetings and they, they wanted to buy a chunk of the street university and they offered me $2 million. So at that point, I said, wait, 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 wait. Two kini, two what? <laughs> Million what? Zimbabwe dollar or America dollar? <laughs> so when they said that, I went back to my secret place to go and consult with my chairman. <laughs> and my chairman said, you need to see what they are seeing. If you go with them now, you will regret it in future. Whew. I said, wow. So, I pulled back and I will tell you at the end of this session where we are right now. Is somebody hearing me? But this is something that did not exist. So I began to think, I said, wait a minute. This is an era, so I totally recreated myself. Now, for years I have run a leadership and mentoring program called Inspired to Inspire. And we'll have a group of people and I will take them through stuff. But I now realized everybody's challenge is different. So we started a new program for leaders called Reimagine Yourself. Now, and it was, it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentoring program. When I started, I was shocked again because I had CEOs from all over the world. I mean, I, I, I tell, and all this is happening from my study at home. You know, my son got married a few months ago and I was shocked because when I went for his wedding, it was the first time I was putting on shoes about six months. I didn't step out. But I had CEOs, senior people from the US, from all over Europe, from all across Africa, from Lebanon, from different countries. And I be, it became the busiest period of my life. Sitting down, and it was four sessions that I will have with the CEO or senior management or business owners and try to help them to reimagine themselves, reimagine their business. We help them to develop, build their personal brand, create a strategic plan for their lives. Because a lot of people understand how to do strategic plans for their business, but not for themselves. So we began to do that, 
and the thing exploded to the point where we now had a waiting list. So I want to share with you today some of the thinking that goes on behind my, you know, behind the scenes and things I have learned from the word of God that I believe will totally help and transform you and help you to begin to reimagine yourself. Can I hear an amen for that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9, it says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. Do you love him? That means there is a dimension that has been prepared for you of things that I has not seen. But a lot of people don't have the confidence to do that because the minute you begin to get an idea that you've not seen around, then people begin to ask, well, and you begin to intimidate yourself. Who have you seen that has done such a thing? And we begin to look for benchmarks. But I've always held on to the fact that if we are not careful on the African continent, we will begin to benchmark stupidity and we'll begin to benchmark things that are no more relevant. When in 1863, the London Underground was being developed as the first of its kind in the world, who were they benchmarking? When in 1811, the master plan of New York, of Manhattan, was developed, a master plan that had roads when people were riding horses. Who were they benchmarking? When the builders of the pyramids in Egypt were building the pyramids that became the tallest man-made structures on earth for 4,000 years, who were they benchmarking? Friends, where I want to lead you to this morning is a place where you can develop your mind to a point where you begin to benchmark your own imagination. Oh, is somebody hearing me today? Where you begin to benchmark your imagination. And that is what I have done, what God has helped me to do throughout my, you know, in my, in my life. Now, I want you to say this after me. I am sensitive to the leadings and the promptings of the Holy Ghost. And I respond positively to them. Let's say that one more time at the top of your voice. I am sensitive to the leading and the prompting of the Holy Ghost. And I respond positively to them. Now, between 2015 and 2017, I've been doing a lot of research on, because that's my, I'm, I'm a researcher, that's basically my training, on how to stay relevant. And I studied many companies and many institutions, and I made some amazing discoveries which are captured in the book Beyond Intelligence, The Simple Practice of Staying Relevant. And some of the things I discovered is that there is nothing like once intelligent, always intelligent. There are people who appeared to be intelligent before COVID. COVID showed up and they began to look like fools. There are nations that appeared to be very intelligent before COVID. But when COVID hit, they were playing catch up. The United States was playing catch up to nations like South Korea. So, the, everything was changed. So, nothing like once intelligent, always intelligent. Your, what you consider your great idea might be a useless idea. Okay, I'm sorry. It came out that way. <laughs> oh, I have a great idea. I have a great idea. It might be a very useless idea. 
Because what gives value to ideas is relevance. That's what gives value to ideas. And that is how your idea resonates. How your idea connects with people and the environment. Now, relevant ideas are ideas that solve the immediate or future problems of people. They provide solutions. So one of the things I learned that will help you stand strong in the next pandemic or the next disruption, always evaluate your current models for relevance. Every great idea has a lifespan. All right? Every, now, <laughs> when you go to the museum, you are going to look at relics in the museum. But do you know every relic in the museum was once a breakthrough <laughs> that people celebrated? Oh, is somebody hearing me today? So, you need to learn how to challenge your own assumptions. Challenge your assumptions. Interrogate your success. You know, when Gillette, they launched their Fusion Pro Glide razors, they pitched, they did an ad. Listen, they did an ad and they pitched their own Fusion Pro Glide against their own Mark III razors. That means in the ad, they came out and said, you know what? Yes, we told you Mark III was awesome. But now we have created something else. This is more awesome. They were challenging and interrogating their own success. And that gives a lot of insight into why Gillette is still in operation since 1903. The ability to reimagine yourself, to recreate yourself, all right? Now, um, Rolex was established in 1905. Let's put that in perspective. The Spanish flu was in 1918. So that means Rolex went through First World War, Second World War, Spanish flu, and every other flu in between, up till the pandemic. And they are standing. They, right now, they have 25% of the watch market. It still is the number one luxury watch brand in the world. Yet, you have some companies that started 10 years ago five years ago, and they were blown away by the pandemic. Okay, if you think Rolex is something, there is a family in Italy called the Antinori family. They make wines and all that. They have been in business since the year 1318. So, let's go. You know, the first world war, we call it the first because it's the one that's documented. All the wars before the First World War. <laughs> These guys have been there. They have been there. And they are still standing today. Is somebody hearing me? Hmm. Okay. You think Antinori family is something? There is a hotel. This is all the research that I was doing for my book beyond intelligence because i want to be, look people ask me what is your greatest fear is to wake up one morning and the world has moved on without me <laughs> that hey you wake up and the world doesn't need me anymore it's a lie <laughs> are you hearing me <laughs> so that is why I am the way I am. So when I, that research that became the book, I was doing the research for myself. And I realized, you know what? There may be other people like me. So we put it in a book. Is somebody hearing me today? 
So listen. Japanese hotel, Hoshi Ryokan, has been in existence <laughs> passing your seatbelts. Since 718 AD, and they are still doing business today. 718 AD. So, these are guys that can tell you church history from an eyewitness. <laughs> now, are you ready? You think that one was something? There is another hotel, a hot spring in Japan that has been in business since the year 705 AD. And they are still in business today. So be careful who you are following and benchmarking. For benchmarking some company that tell you, oh, things are so bad. Yet, there are people out there. So when I, and, and I looked at that, I said, I, Wale, I want to be a timeless brand. That's why I write and do all the things I do. Winston Churchill said he was, he said history was going to be kind to him. And they said, how can you be so sure history is going to be kind to you? He said, because I intend to write my own history. And that is what I'm doing. Writing my own history. Oh, is somebody hearing me? So, the ability, when I began to write this, you know, do this research, many, now, <laughs> get ready for this. A lot of businesses failed because they believe they lie. <sighs> Who knows? Okay. Take a deep breath. How many of you have heard this before? Knowledge is power. How many of you have heard it? I am so happy I'm in the right place. So how come the greatest solutions don't come from the people with the greatest information? How come Microsoft was started by Harvard dropouts and not a Harvard computer science professor? How come that the greatest businesses are not run by business administration professors? How come political science professors are not the best politicians? Is somebody hearing me today? Why was Facebook not started by a, an IT professor? It was started by dropouts. <laughs> Listen. It's not the information you have that matters, but how you are able to convert the information into solutions. Is somebody hearing me today? Then don't be emotionally attached to a method or a process <laughs> that this is how we've done it. You just end up like Moses. Moses. God said, first time, hit the rock. Water will come out. Moses went, pop, hit the rock. Next time, they needed water. God said, okay, Moses, speak to the rock. Ah, Moses said, Oga. Last time now. <laughs> this is how we do it. This is a tried and proven method. The processes. This is... <laughs> Man, he hit the rock and he missed his promised land. A lot of people are missing their promised land today because they are emotionally attached to processes. Processes that are outdated. Processes that should be changed. Alright? And then another thing I found out. Of course, a vision for today that, not, that does not encompass possibilities for tomorrow is doomed. Alright? A vision that does not encompass those possibilities. Because, listen, 
if you are not researching the future, you will live in a world researched and designed by the researchers. Let me give you some stats, and all this you'll get in Beyond Intelligence. Let me give you some stats that will help you. I looked at different nations according to the number of researchers per one million inhabitants that they have. Researchers per one million inhabitants. So Israel is the largest in the world. They have 8,250 researchers for every one million inhabitants. Um, the U.S. has 4,217 researchers for every 1 million inhabitants, which is significant because of their population. Japan has 5,328. South Korea has 6,856. Now, I want you to realize with me that we are in the thousands, you know, so the average right now is about 6,000, Okay researchers per one million inhabitants let's come to africa now south africa let me let's get the good ones south africa has 432 researchers per million inhabitants can you see the drop kenya 225 researchers per 1 million inhabitants and we don't even know how many of them are Kenyans. But be encouraged. Zambia has 40, Malawi 48, and Nigeria 38. <laughs> so if you are not researching the future, so now you see what has happened. Um, I, I gave a breakdown of the billions of dollars they are spending on research. The pharmaceutical companies spending billions on research. Then COVID showed up. Then vaccines become the most precious commodity on earth. So, I want you to understand certain things. By the way, I've not even started. This is just my introduction, you know. I want you to understand certain things. That you must have a rightly calibrated table of expectation. What you know is not all you need to know. If you are not researching into the future, researching into your trade, researching into possibilities, you will become a victim of circumstances and you will be at the mercy of researchers. So having said that, so between 2015 and 2017, this was the research I was doing. And um, because I wanted to think ahead, I wanted to be ahead of the curve. And um, the interesting thing I shared with a lot of CEOs then that disruption is coming. Because you know, we had thought disruption will come maybe in some other breakthrough technology or whatever. And CEOs that I interacted with, a lot of them were preaching disruption in their head. But you see, they were not planning for it. The ability to think ahead and plan for what you think takes a lot of faith. But that is how to stay ahead of the curve. Did you like the introduction? So we can start now. <laughs> so, number one, we're going to, you must cultivate. So I've already talked about always think ahead, isn't it? Then you must cultivate the right relationships. 
very important. Revelation 17, 14 says he has, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. They that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Many are called, few are chosen. But even out of the few that are chosen, a fewer number are faithful to the call. Is somebody hearing me today? And you must separate yourself by being faithful to the call. Everybody is called. Now, we are all distinguished before God. But there is a level that are certain things we need to put in place. Luke chapter 2 verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. Now, this is so important. Of course, those are what I call the four wheels of human development. He increased in wisdom, so he increased mentally. He increased in stature. He increased physically. Favor with God, he increased spiritually. Favor with man, he increased socially. Those are the four wheels of human development. If you're going to prosper in any field, they must be in place. It's not either or. Mental development, physical development, spiritual development, and social development. All right? But today, I want to deal with the aspect of favor. Do you know, as a child of God, we all have favor with God, isn't it? <laughs> now, where the problem for a lot of people lies is favor with man. <laughs> is somebody hearing me? Look, if favor with God automatically translated to favor with man, then it would not have been written that Jesus had favor with God and then he had favor with man. Favor with God does not automatically guarantee favor with man, no. <laughs> A prisoner who gets saved in prison has favor with God. He still needs favor with man to get out. Oh. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So if Jesus needed favor with a man, then we all need favor with a man. Is somebody hearing me? Lift your hand and say, Father, thank you because I have favor with you and I have favor with man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in Matthew, uh, no, let's look at Mark 15 from verse 43. Jesus had been killed. You know, for 3 to 45. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Hey, 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 listen. Peter, all the apostles, with all their anointing, they couldn't go and get the body. It was Joseph of Arimathea, somebody who had influence out there in the marketplace he went boldly to demand for the body is somebody hearing me today <laughs> because there's a totally look <laughs> there's a totally different level of operation to deal with things like that the abundant mind you know we all have the, I've been doing a series on Facebook you know, 
Pastor, I cannot imagine. When I started this series, I just felt maybe we'll do about three or four talking on the mind. It's called the abundant mind. That's on Wale Akemi resource page on Facebook. I am on episode 78. 78. Just looking at the mind from different angles. Because my calling is to transform Africa one mind at a time. Making poverty and unemployment a choice and not a sentence. <laughs> Is somebody hearing me? That's what I'm, that's why I'm on earth. So 78 episodes. Jesus needed favor with man. And a lot of people have downplayed the need for that. Joseph was in prison. You know, he was in Potiphar's house. Let's show you. Because I like to show everybody because I was once accused of writing my own Bible. So I like everybody to see it. Joseph is in Potiphar's house. Let's look at what happened from um, verse 5 of Genesis 39. It came to pass from that time he had made him overseer in his house. I mean, God was with Joseph. He said everything had prospered, you know. And uh, over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He did not know what he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Is somebody hearing me? King James says, well favored. His mind made him an astute administrator in the house of Potiphar. So his excellence in what he was doing translated to what? Favor. When he got into prison, his excellence in what he was doing Translated to what? Favor. Okay, okay. Let me... I don't know how I'm going to say this nicely. Are you ready? So I'll just say it. Favor with man does not come with prayer. It comes with excellence in doing what you are doing. <laughs> You cannot be praying, find a favor, find a favor, find a favor, and you are a mumu in the place. <laughs> Is somebody hearing me today? Hmm? And when you look at it throughout the Bible, it's a recurring theme. There can be no lifting if you don't have favor with man. And how do we walk in it? It says, let not Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them upon the table of your heart. So shall you find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. So, mercy and truth. Those are activators of favor. That I am going to be a merciful person. The love of God is going to flow through me. In everything. Joseph refused to be bitter. Do you know Joseph could have gotten into Potiphar's house full of depression? And I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. You know, I didn't do anything wrong. Then he finds himself in prison. If he was a Niger man, he would be crying and cursing the people from his village that sent him into the prison. Some of you will get that day after tomorrow. allowed his environment to go to, 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 to permeate and affect his love work. A lot of people are offended. 
The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, sound mind. So on your way to having a sound mind, you need to go through love. Is somebody hearing me? You are holding grudges with everybody you are holding. You know, and you want to walk in favor. You are not even walking in favor with yourself. And you know, love is seeing people the way you want God to see you. <laughs> now, you know, that just settles it. <laughs> because you see, a lot of us, we judge people by their actions, but we want to be judged by our intentions. When you begin to see people the way God sees, the way you want God to see you. Because you know, Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, it says, if a brother is overtaken by a fault, you who are spiritual, in the spirit of meekness, restore such a person so you will not fall into the same thing. Listen. Every time you pass judgment on someone, you are setting the standard for how you want to be judged. Are you hearing me? So, if you are not, that says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. But it is not supposed to stay in our heart. It's supposed to flow from our heart to everybody. You know, Romans 5, 5. You say, you all have the love of God. It's been shed abroad in your heart. We all have it. Have you read in the scripture, it says, to the merciful, he will show himself merciful. Let me tell you something about favor. <laughs> One of the disadvantages for me during COVID is that I've not held cash. You know, and I'm sure that's happened to a lot of people. So, it's more of electronic money. But whenever I go to places, I just like, you know, the security man, whatever, who has served me, um, the waiter. One day I was reading, Frank Sinatra went to a place and the waiter came and he asked the waiter, what's the biggest tip you've ever received in your life? The waiter said, $100. Sinatra said, who gave you? The waiter said, you did, sir. I said, that is how I want to be when I grow up. So, I became the big tipper. Give now, I'm talking of favor with man. Hmm. You get to a restaurant, you get to a place, or they, they, they say there's no parking. And just wind down. It's, ah, it's you. They clear everything. Favor with man. You come in, I'm thinking of talking of favor with man. You are thinking of the high office. The person, beware of the person that cannot say yes, but who can say no. <laughs> are you hearing me? Because they know Wale has come. He's a giver. So everybody, I've been in restaurants, people. Their manager came and said, our waiters are always hustling to be the one to serve you. Is somebody hearing me? Favor with man. You go in the place, you eat full of anger. <laughs> you talk to the waiter the way human beings should not be talked to. Yeah, I know Okay. <laughs> Is somebody hearing me? Don't complicate the gospel. Favor with man starts in places like that. But you have to let the love of God flow out of your heart to people. Simple courtesies. Thank you. Somebody starts, thank you. Oh, please. Are you hearing me? You will be amazed. You know why that gives you an advantage? Because most people on earth are mumu. 
they are crazy. They treat people, no, they treat people badly. Are you hearing me? Most people treat people badly. When you are that person that treats them right, the loyalty you will get, money cannot buy it. Mm. So favor with man is so powerful. Another thing, so he said, let mercy and truth. Another thing that activates your favor with man, like I said, is um, your excellence in what you do. Distinguishing yourself in what you do. Being the best. All right? In this, and let me tell you, when you have done that, <laughs> oh, the favor with man you will have. Let me give you an example. I know churches in Nigeria that they have special services. I've not seen it here and I'm so grateful to God for that. They have special services. Listen, anointing for visa. <laughs> that God will give somebody special anointing for US visa. <laughs> I know of ministries, whole ministries that are built around that. So people are pray, find that visa, find that visa. Okay. You know, some people, they express their ignorance with confidence. <laughs> eh? Now, how many of you, listen, is there anybody here who has heard of the O-1 visa? Okay, you see now? You see now? How can you believe for something you don't know about? So, majority of people are praying for visa, hustling for visa. The O-1 visa, listen, and you can check U.S. citizens and immigration website. O-1 visa is a visa for the individual who has extraordinary ability in sciences, art, education, business, or athletics, or who has demonstrated record of extraordinary achievements in motion picture or television industry and has been recognized nationally or internationally for those achievements. Such people qualify for the O-1 visa, no prayer. Now listen, listen. Now listen, eligibility. The all uh, it covers individuals, like I said, with an extraordinary, extraordinary ability in science, education, business, athletics. Individuals with extraordinary, extraordinary ability in arts. Extra arts. And are you hearing me? Listen, the world honors a productive mind. Now, the UK have their own equivalent of it. It's called a global talent visa. <laughs> it says, if you are a leader or potential leader in one of the following fields, academia or research, arts and culture, digital technology, and you are at least 18 years old, you qualify. But you know what? Everybody is praying for a visitor's visa. Uh, somebody hear me? Then, Dubai, the UAE. <laughs> they said, the, 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 the ruler of Dubai says it will grant citizenship to foreign residents for the first time provided they can add value to the Gulf state. Those eligible will include investors, specialized talents, doctors, engineers, artists, 
they and their families will be able to hold dual nationality. Are you hearing me? Hmm. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 4. <laughs> I want you to read it yourself. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It says, for to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. A living dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> A productive unbeliever is better than an unproductive tongue-talking Christian. At least the world will recognize them. Are you hearing me today? And this is not new. In the book of Daniel, when they were taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, you know what he said? He said, gather those with superior intellect they are the ones for people like Daniel they were the people with superior intellect they are the ones that could you know hang out with the king is somebody hearing me today so favor with my I was working somewhere and I think I've shared this story a couple of times. My driver that they gave me, my bodyguard that they gave me, they were Muslims. I finished doing work for them. I've worked in 22 African countries. I finished work. I went to preach somewhere in the evening. This Muslim driver and bodyguard was shouting the loudest amen when I was preaching. You know why? Beggars don't have a choice. We will humble the world with superior intellect. <laughs> All right. Then the last thing. So we've talked about think ahead. Cultivate, cultivate favor with man. Very important. Then you need to build the right structures. Build the right structures. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24 and all the way to 27. Talk about two houses. One was built on sand. One was built on a rock. And the one, he said, the storm came to the two houses. Not just the one. The storm came to the two. All right? But one stood and the other fell. My question, what brought that house down? It was not the storm because the storm came to the two. It was the foundation. Trials come to reveal our foundations. All right? One of the main reasons why businesses do not thrive during tough times, why a lot of businesses do not thrive, is that they have not built the structures that can support them during that period. Because, ironically, some of the most amazing breakthroughs in business happened during down times. During the Spanish flu in 1918, while a lot of people were doing exactly what they are doing now, you know, which is nothing, some people were thinking, it was a time for thinking and research. Did you realize, students of history, the Spanish flu was 1918 to 1920. The decade of the 20s was known as the Roaring Twenties. Why? Because innovations came out. It was one of the innovations that came out of the Spanish flu was the television. Another Spanish flu innovation was the blender. Another Spanish flu innovation was the vacuum cleaner. Um, Band-aid. So many things. Even cheeseburger was a Spanish flu innovation. Somebody was at home and think, well, just, you know, we can find another way to do this thing. Are you hearing me? So nobody should hide behind the pandemic. Let's reimagine ourselves and then we ride over the wave. Is somebody hearing me today? Now, 2010, there was, a, there was an earthquake in Haiti. Now, listen, like 
300,000 people or so died. And the report here says there was no one in the capital that did not lose something. All right? It was, yeah, it was 7.0 on the Richter scale. They said there was nobody that did not lose something. The government had to operate from the parking lot of a police station. It was that bad. Now, in 2002, I was living in Seattle, Washington. And I had got... <laughs> I'm tempted to edit this story, but I'm going to give it to you unedited. So, I went, I was having a meeting in the office of a particular bishop. Okay? And while we are there, suddenly, there were not some, some other people, ministers, suddenly, there was a loud bang, like thunder. Boom. And then next thing, the place began to shake. Like this. I saw paintings drop off the wall. And it began to increase in momentum. How many of you, my imaginative, my Think of a bad dream in slow motion. It was an earthquake. Now, the bishop, this is the part I wanted to edit. You know, trials come to reveal our foundations. <laughs> the bishop stood up. Jesus, it's an earthquake. Jesus the bishop took off and abandoned all his guests in his office. Now, the Seattle earthquake was 6.9 on the Richter scale and services were interrupted for a few hours. Only one person died and it was not from earthquake, it was from a heart attack. It did not solidify <laughs> Is somebody hearing me today? Yet, the Haiti earthquake, 7.0, 300,000 people dead. What was the difference? Infrastructure. Infrastructure. The houses in Seattle were built to bend. Now, that is even scarier. You, you, you are in a higher, and it's bending like this, and you're looking at the water. <laughs> But that's how they were built. A lot of businesses, so sorry, the 230,000 homes and businesses, you know, so when you look at these two, Haiti and Seattle, infrastructure was in place in Seattle before the earthquake happened. And that is so important. A lot of businesses fail because they don't have the right structures. Christians especially don't think deeply about this because they think that by being led by the Spirit, you don't need structure. Indeed, it came to pass. When the singers were as one and the trumpeters to make one sound to be heard in praising God, so they had come out in the right formation they are as one. They are united in the right formation. Guess what happened after? Verse 13 says the glory of God hit the place. The place was filled with a cloud. And you know, there are too many examples to show you that God always shows up when there is order. Are you hearing me? In Genesis chapter 1, that was order. You know, darkness covered the face of the deep, so there was disorder there. And then what did God do? He began, you, if you look carefully, you will see a very systematic operation. God said, let, God, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created the, 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 what's that place? the project ground as it were and you see that everything in Genesis was created in sequential order why didn't God say 
Let the heavens, let the earth, let the sun, let the, everything just be. <laughs> because God is a God of order. Why didn't in Genesis God just say, hey, man has fallen. Jesus, go down. Go and die. No. Because man did not even know he needed a savior. So guess what happened? The law came. The law came to show man you cannot please God. The judges came and they dealt with man. Ooh. Then the prophets came and said he's coming. He is coming. He is coming. 4,000 years of declaration. Is somebody hearing me today? God is a God of order. And he blesses order. And this is so important for you. So imagine if the sun had no time for setting and no time for rising. He just did it whenever it wanted. <laughs> Alright? So, and there are too many scriptures. I won't go into all of them. But the bottom line is God blesses order. So you need to look at your business. Make sure you have the right structures in place. Don't want to be the alpha, the omega, the forwarder, and the backwarder of your company. Because I've seen too many people, and I've been there before, where you want to be everything, and invariably, you begin to destroy the very things you built. Because you're, you have blind spots. So put the right structures, have the right advisory team, have the right things, you know, people who will help you this is what you need to put in place for taxes. This is what you need to put in place for this. You need that. Very, very important. All right? And then, let's wrap up with this. Never. What did I say? I want you to say, never, ever, ever. Ever, ever. Never let go of the principles of faith. Never. Never. And when COVID happened, this is where many people missed it. When COVID struck, people panicked. They stopped giving. <laughs> if COVID was enough to stop you from giving, it means you did not have a revelation of giving in the first place. Is somebody hearing me? Because if you had a revelation, then... That's when you realize I need to figure out how to give more than ever before. So, <laughs> anybody, those early days of COVID, very important that we continue. Because think of it. A lot of people felt God was caught unawares by COVID. So let me now figure out how to go about this. They stopped giving, they stopped tithing. And they became victims. Because you see, when I give, let me tell you what it does. Every time I'm giving, it's sending a message to my mind that I am blessed. So I'm not giving for anybody. I'm giving for myself. Because every time I give, I am reinforcing the fact in my mind, I am blessed. I have had the privilege of giving away cars. I've had the privilege... <laughs> Of giving away even houses. Every time I gave, it reinforces that I am blessed. So I'm not doing it for anybody. And let me show you something before we go. I mean, Isaiah 55, verse 1 says, Oh, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. He that has no money, come and buy. Eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money, without price. Isn't that something? Come and buy without price. And what he was telling them to buy was not a necessity of wine. <laughs> they come and buy without money. You know, one thing that the lack of faith has done for people, many people <laughs> have disqualified themselves from the abundant life because of price tags. How many 
many of you have looked at something and you say, whoa, this thing is nice. And you just see the price. You say, eh. <laughs> How many guilty in the house? <laughs> but you just see the price. Eh. But you know, he says, come and buy without price. How do you do that? You need a revelation. Let me show you something. If this does not get you excited, you need to be prayed for. John chapter 21. Are you getting something though? John chapter 21. Let's read from verse 1. And we read all the way. He says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, we go with you. They went forth, entered into a ship, and immediately that night they caught nothing. A lot of Christians have found themselves at that point. They have been with the word. They've been, you know, trying to make this word work for them. And it gets to a point, it looks like the word is not delivering what you want. Then COVID hits. And they're like, eh, we are believing God before this thing. <laughs> and it has not happened. What are we going to do now? So guess what? They now, that's when they forget giving, they forget tithing, they forget all the principles of the word. They try to make it work themselves. It will not work because the flesh can never deliver what the word was designed to deliver. Oh, is somebody hearing me? How many people learn this the hard way? <laughs> so let's go on, verse 4. We go on to verse... Um, but when it was morning... Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples knew not it was Jesus. That's important because he was appearing in a different form. So they did not know it was him. Let's go on. Get your shouting clothes ready. Are you ready? Then Jesus said unto them, Children, do you have any meat? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast your net on the right side of the ship and you shall find they cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Go on. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he girt his, fish, his fisher's coat on him for he was naked and cast himself into the sea. Now, just, okay, and the other, let's go on, let's go on. And the other disciple came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but it, as it were, 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. Go on. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish he laid thereon. Now, pause. A couple of things. Isn't it exciting? They did not know who it was. But the minute they saw abundance, they said, it is the Lord. Because that is brand Jesus. The Jesus brand is a brand of abundance. So even though they didn't know, the minute they saw an abundance, they knew, ah, this is the Lord. Is somebody hearing me? Now, they caught this miraculous fish, yeah? And then something interesting happens. Let's go on. Now, no, go back again. Go back. As soon as they were come to the land, listen, they saw a fire of coals there. And what was on the fire? <laughs> what was on the fire? Fish and bread. Now, they have not yet brought the one they caught. Because the next verse, look. 
Jesus said, bring the fish which you have now caught. So wait, 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 wait. They had not yet brought the one they had caught. But Jesus already had fish. He did not need what they were catching. <laughs> Is somebody hearing me today? He did not need what they were catching. He already had there. It is a privilege to give. He does not need what you have. It's a privilege to give. They had caught fish. They had not yet brought it. And Jesus was already preparing fish. When I give, it's, because, it's not because he needs what I'm giving. He did not need it. And this will liberate you and convert the stingiest of people into generous people. Look. Look. Verse 11. And you know, you don't need to go there, but in Psalm 50, God said, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. The world is mine, all its fullness. Will I eat the bulls or drink, or, or, or drink the blood of goats? So he says, you are coming to offer things, not because I need, but what I need is your act of faith in doing this. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes. 153. Someone had time to count all those things. You understand? For there were so many, yet the net was not broken. Go on. Jesus said to them, come and dine. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Knowing it was the Lord. Now, so my parting shot to you. Jesus served them breakfast. He did not need what they had caught in order for them to eat. That is so profound. So, so, so profound. There is a level, and I want to, uh, you know, they caught fish they did not need. There is a level that you can get to in God where, yes, we will work hard, but we will not need what we are getting. Okay, somebody needs to. Hmm. Listen, let me show you something. And then I will be out of here. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. Ephesians 4 28. Let him who stole steal no more. Rather, let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may do what? That he may do what? have to give to him that needs that means are you hearing me that <laughs> i serve god for my living and i work for my giving where i have entered into god into this dynamic where i know yes i will work hard but when the money comes, God has already sorted me out. He's already preparing the fish. He did not need what I was catching. Oh, is somebody hearing me? Remember, come and buy without money. And faith is the currency of the spirit. And you spend your faith by your words. It's the currency of the spirit you spend by the things you say. God is not concerned about how much something costs. He's not concerned about the price. The issue has never been the cost. He's not concerned whether you drive a Rolls Royce or you are riding a motorcycle. He's not going to reward you because you saved money for him. He's not looking for someone to save money. No, 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 no. God is not concerned about all that. If you will apply the principles of faith, 
then when they say there is a casting down you will say there is a lifting up then you will say a thousand will fall at my side ten thousand at my right hand that eleven thousand people destroyed but you are still standing why because the word of god is the pillar of your life is somebody hearing me today when we have the word and that's why you must renew your mind let the word of god be flowing let it keep your mind lubricated let the word of god be flowing i read every single day no matter what i read a minimum of five chapters of the bible every day then every night before i sleep i'm playing the word playing the word playing the word because my mind has to be constantly lubricated with the word of god that 30 minutes in a day cannot pass i have my alarm set 30 minutes in a day cannot pass without me declaring the word of god concerning my life concerning my children concerning my business are you hearing me because when things like the pandemic happen it's an opportunity for god to show off his children we cannot be subject to what they are subject to my christianity must show a different kind of person in first corinthians chapter 3 he rebuked them he says you are behaving like mere men god does not want you to operate like a mere man a mere man when they are down you are down when they are up you are up when they are confused you are confused with them but we are the circumcision that when they are down we are up when it's not working for them it's working for us when this door is closed seven doors open here for us is somebody hearing me we will work hard but you know what we realize that all our needs have been met supernaturally and so we say god what do we do with this money and he will begin to show you how you be a blessing to humanity is somebody hearing me today now this is the master key this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith Whew. hallelujah so faith comes by hearing so guess what just stop there whatever you hear the most is where you will have the greatest faith if what you have heard the most is the news that's where you will have the greatest faith if what you have heard most is destruction that's where you will have the greatest faith and if what you have heard the most is the word of god that is where you will have the greatest faith. Asante Nisana. This is Jubilee Christian Church Thicker Road. of me being crucified with Christ was to eradicate that old person that was incompatible with God. That man was killed on the cross. The reality of the fact in Christianity is we are born of the spirit but we are discipled by the word. Welcome, Welcome to Jubilee Christian Church, Thicker Road. Understand that there is a capacity that is called the nature of God that is in you. We preach Christ.